So um, today, as um, Dirk explained to you, I'm going to be talking about aging gracefully with exercise and social engagement. So first of all, we're going to talk about changes in cognition with age, then move on to risk factors for dementia, including mod modifiable risk factors, exercise, and social engagement. I'm going to also talk about challenges for the nursing home setting, um, including some of the problems that residents have faced during COVID-19. And then I'll also talk about some in interventions that we've worked on and some that we are proposing for the future. So first of all, I'd like to thank my collaborators, Dr. Jason Crandall from Western Kentucky University, Caroline Wood, who is a graduate student here at the University of South Carolina, and Dr. Jason Yang, who is also at the University of South Carolina in exercise science. And I would also like to thank my department colleagues who've been amazing and really appreciate, I really appreciate the C-STAR series. Um, it's been so informative to go back and watch some of the videos and um, to be able to listen to many of them live as well. So really enjoy um, having that be part of our department. And, and I feel it adds a tremendous amount of um, scholarship and focus on scholarship for the department. So I've been a speech language pathologist for over 30 years and my research has dealt with dementia, um, both looking at individuals in the community who've been in the early stage of dementia, and I have the opportunity to follow them over time. Um, more recently, I've focused in on interventions for aging and dementia. And um, this particular slide shows an intervention called bingo size that we developed for the nursing home setting. And I wanted to point out a two, two aspects to this slide. As you can see, the older woman in the foreground is playing the game of bingo and exercising. And I'll explain more about how that takes place. But I wanted to point out that she is both socially engaged with the woman who is leading the exercise at her table and she is also exercising. Now, in this case, she's only exercising her hands. However, we know that grip strength also improves someone's um, prevention of, a, of having a bad fall. It can aid in dressing and bathing and many daily activities. And so um, I will talk more about the importance of exercise, um, but I thought this slide really displayed nicely the two focal points of my talk today, which are exercise and social engagement. So there are various changes that occur with age and in cognition. I'm sure many of you are familiar with these, but I wanted to review again that there are various neurophysiological factors that contribute to reduce cognitive performance in aging. And the effect on cognition can include serial processes such as um, processing speed, size of working memory, inhibition of extraneous environmental stimuli, and sensory losses that also contribute to cognitive decline, such as in the area of auditory processing. The co cognitive capacity is thought to remain intact with aging, but encoding, storage, and retrieval become less efficient or are interrupted by reduced attention and working memory capacity. The slowed processing speed can interfere with problem solving, extended time um, to perceive, interpret, select, and execute responses. Now, um, we can look at the possible changes with age according to decline in cognitive functioning over time um, and over years. And the top slope shows normal aging, where we might see just a slight and gradual decline in cognitive functioning.
However, there are other groups that include those individuals who are in the preclinical stage of dementia, who then encounter more problems and have mild cognitive impairment. And then finally, the cognitive impairments um, accumulate to the extent that the person is not able to function independently in their daily living. And they, um, at that point, have dementia. And of course, um, dementia is the global cognitive impairment that some older adults experience. And there are a number of different causes for dementia. Um, that trajectory of cognitive decline could possibly be zoomed into in terms of short-term cognitive changes, even moment by moment and throughout days and over years. Um, hopefully our interventions may alter the shape or slope of the longer term trajectory of cognitive decline. One view that Bredesen put forth in 2017 in a book that he published is that um, cog cognition may be affected by different um, neuropathologies that occur in the brain and these accumulate over time. And so it's not just one individual insult, but multiple risk factors that accumulate until the person is so impaired that they exhibit dementia. So our hope is to actually intervene on some of these risk factors that result in cognitive impairment. So some of the risk factors that were described in a Lancet 2017 um, publication include that um, early in life, we're born with our genetics and we may have more or less um, education. In midlife, we may begin to experience hearing loss, hypertension, obesity, and then in late life, um, there are some modifiable factors that are perhaps um, areas that we can intervene in. So you can't really go back into someone's history and say, you know, get more education in the past. But in the late life, we could look at such things as smoking, depression, physical inactivity, social isolation and diabetes. And the two areas that I want to talk with you about today include the modifiable risk factors of physical inactivity and social isolation. As you know, Alzheimer's disease typically has a slow decline with memory impairment as one of the earliest signs. Um, early in my career in the late 80s and early 90s, I looked at writing impairment in people with early Alzheimer's disease. And we did find some interesting observations about how writing and spelling may be affected by Alzheimer's disease. However, um, memory was by far the area that was most significantly um, impaired early in the course of the disease. Um, we're also interested in the degree to which people participate in a community. Um, in a large study that was conducted by Yun et al. in 2020, um, they had followed um, participants over a five-year period and found that those who had low social and community involvement converted to dementia. In another study, um, which included 1,800 participants, there was evidence that physical activity reduces risk for cognitive decline. And they found that um, computed energy expenditures for reported activities of 70 to 81 year olds, when that, that was regressed on cognitive measures over time, those reporting the highest level of activity had a 20% risk reduction for cognitive decline and dementia. The mini mental state is a popular examination of global cognitive functioning, and it's reported frequently in the literature. So I mention it here for the students that we have um, who have 
who are watching this presentation or for others who might not be directly involved with working with um, individuals with dementia, but it's a very commonly used scale. There's another um, particular assessment that is similar called the MOCA or the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. And that may be even a little more sensitive to the mini mental state exam. However, um, the MMSE is reported um, very frequently in the literature and I just wanted to mention it here. In one study, participants who maintained or increased their physical activity were 3.6 times less likely to exhibit cognitive decline as measured by the MMSE scores. And men in the lowest um, activity quartile at baseline had significantly elevated risk for cognitive decline as they aged. So let's go on and talk more about exercise. Well, we know unfortunately that the body changes with age and it doesn't look as good as people get older. So we have to think of ways to intervene for the older adult and to help them to be physically fit and active. There was a landmark study that was published in 1953 where um, the London conductors of bus double-decker buses were compared to the drivers and it was discovered that conductors who climbed approximately 500 to 700 steps per day were at approximately half the risk of dying of cardiovascular disease when compared with the drivers. And I did want to mention something here that um, of course, this is a study on cardiovascular disease, and I wanted to point out for those of you who work with people with aphasia and focus in on aphasia for your research or clinical practice, a lot of the risk factors for Alzheimer's disease are similar to those for stroke and aphasia. And in fact, one of the common causes of dementia is vascular dementia. And so there is quite a bit of overlap. And so whatever I present today on preventative strategies should also apply to those individuals who have aphasia as a result of stroke. So what are the forms of exercise? Um, we can look at aerobic exercise, including running, stationary bicycle, and walking. We can um, look at strength, use of weights or flexible bands. Um, we can examine exercise in terms of flexibility, such as the use of yoga or stretching. And there are also balance exercises, um, which is an, a problem area for a lot of older adults. So another way that we can um, measure exercise is in terms of intensity. So we can measure heart rate, perceived level of exertion, and VO2 max, which looks at the oxygen usage um, of someone who is exercising strenuously and um, shows the ability to use oxygen, a higher VO2 max is a positive thing. And so that is something that athletes try to increase if at all possible. We can also look at duration or the length of exercise sessions. We can examine adherence. So you can develop an exercise program for someone, but if they don't attend, they're not going to benefit. And so we can look at percentage or number of sessions attended. We can also view exercise in terms of its relation to cognitive testing or intervention. Did the exercise occur prior to the test or intervention? Are the exercise and cognitive assessments intermingled? Or does exercise occur after learning and perhaps um, helps with consolidation of memories? As I mentioned, adherence is important. And in research on exercise with older adults, the average rate of adherence is 70%. 
Um, this actually sounds pretty good for those of you who've tried to start an exercise program and maybe have not um, kept with it. But keep in mind, this is in research where people are given incentives to continue to exercise. Some of the negatives for adhering to exercise might include being in a nursing home setting where um, the physical makeup is not conducive to adhering to exercise or whether um, there are um, people to take someone to an exercise group if they have some physical impairments. Um, we know that exercise programs that are unsupervised um, often do not have as good of an adherence uh, because people are often afraid of falling. And exercise programs that are high intensity are often unrealistic for older adults. And so that might deter them from participation. A positive is that we know that older adults really like to exercise with others. They really benefit from social aspects of exercise. Now, there are some possible low intensity exercise that results in improvement also in cognition, although there is less research on the lower intensity exercise. In a study of over a thousand older adults in rural communities, um, participants reported their exercise. So they self-reported how much they exercised. Um, their mini mental state exam scores were also monitored for two years. And it was determined that the highest exercise group was protected from si significant decline in MMSE scores. Interestingly, even the least frequent and strenuous level of exercise exhibited some protective effects on cognition in this study. Women with lower baseline exercise levels may benefit more. So if you start at a lower level and you start to exercise, you might have more of a benefit. Yaf and colleagues looked at um, the benefit of walking and they investigated women over age 65 who were physically and cognitively healthy. The participants reported the number of blocks they walked at baseline and those who walked more adjusting for other factors were significantly less likely to demonstrate cognitive declines on the mini men mental state examination six years later. Now, in a randomized control trial with a mean age of 81 and dementia, so now we're moving into research that is looked that looks at people with cognitive impairment. Um, they compared groups who were walking or not walking across a 15 week time period and they found significant improvement in the rapid evaluation of cognitive functions, also improved walking speed, stride length, and reduction of double limb support time in those who were walking um, more and were not in the control group. Unfortunately, the control participants showed decline, and that is the typical trajectory once someone starts to demonstrate dementia without any type of intervention. Um, in another study by Erickson and colleagues, they looked at the amount of walking and how it associated with um, gray matter um, volume. And they found that various parts of the brain were associated with uh, or were larger actually or had greater volume than in those who were not exercising. And the highlighted areas here, this is not a um, functional MRI, this is based on um, gray matter volume, showed um, increase in size when the highest quartile group was compared to the um, participants who walked less. So in the highest quartile, they walked about six to, six to nine miles per week. We can look at aerobic exercise performed 15 minutes prior to assessment of cognitive functioning. And it's been reported that processing speed, attention, 
inhibition, short-term memory, working memory, executive control, and cognitive flexibility, all prefrontal um, uh, cognitive functions um, improve with exercise. Additionally, verbal fluency improves, audiovisual perception, and associative novel word learning. A meta-analysis found that aerobic exercise had a moderately favorable effect on cognition, but combined exercise and resistance training did not. So this is a study that is really pointing to the benefit of aerobic exercise and perhaps less so to other forms of combined exercise. Um, the exercise interventions in this meta-analysis included um, exercising on average about 3.4 days per week um, at moderate, or sorry, 3.4 days per week um, for sessions at moderate intensity, 45 minutes per session for in all about 18 weeks and consisted primarily of aerobic exercise. Control groups with mild cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's disease in comparison experienced decline. There have been a series of studies that have been conducted in Finland with twins. So I mentioned before that um, health benefit, exercise, cognitive outcomes are all influenced by a person's genetics. And so in this particular series of research studies, the thought is to compare two adult twins with each other in pairs who are discordant for physical activity, where one twin is active and one is inactive. Um, it's thought that cortical volumes are stable in early adulthood, so possibly changes in brain structure could be attributed to exercise. The twin who walked or jogged had greater gray matter volume than the sedentary twin in the area of the hippocampus, striatum, and non-dominant inferior frontal gyrus. Additionally, another electrophysiological visual mismatch study showed that, again, the twin who was um, inactive showed longer latencies. So let's review where we're at in terms of what the model might be for physical activity having a positive impact on brain functioning, brain volume, mood, and cognitive improvement. So it's thought that physical activity positively affects molecular and cellular changes in the brain, which then has a positive effect on brain volume in particular areas and in functional changes in the brain. This then has a positive effect on mood and cog cognition. Additionally, mood and cognition have a reciprocal relationship with one another. So many of you are familiar with the research on depression and its um, effects on cognition. And so here by possibly improving mood, we can also um, improve cognition um, and also co having better cognition may lead to better mood. So, Going on then to social engagement, which is um, also, um, which also positively impacts mood, we find that unfortunately, approximately one quarter of community dwelling Americans age 65 and older are socially isolated. And a significant portion of adults in the United, in the United States report feeling lonely. 35% of adults age 65 and older report feeling lonely, and 43% of adults age 60 and older report feeling lonely. In one study, the epidemiological study of the elderly, 2,000 community-dwelling older adults reported their social, fitness, and productive activities. Elders with higher social activity had lower mortality after 13 years. 
On the other hand, um, also those with fewer social ties were at increased risk for cognitive decline. Another study showed that having a lower community affairs score on the clinical dementia rating, which again, some of you are probably familiar with, was associated with a higher risk of conversion to dementia. So what are some challenges for nursing homes? We talked about social engagement being important for healthy aging, for brain health. And unfortunately, nursing homes are, are um, have problems in this area of providing residents with social time and physical activity. Approximately two thirds of all nursing home residents in the US have some type of cognitive impairment. So residents living in nursing homes spend less time socializing and participating in physical activities than older adults living in the community. Residents living in nursing homes tend to spend most of their time isolated in their rooms. The lack of social engagement is a risk factor for dementia. So prolonged lack of stimulation can lead to apathy, boredom, depression, and loneliness, and may impact the rate of decline associated with dementia. Cohen Mansfield and colleagues who have studied nursing home residents and some of the challenges of living in a nursing home stated that engagement is being occupied with an external stimulus. Camp described engagement as connectiveness with the social and physical environment. Humphrey and colleagues found that an accessible environment a positive communication approach and an activity led to engagement of a person with dementia. This is another um, schematic view of how we might be able to intervene with engagement, particularly with people who are in a nursing home setting. So um, in the bottom left corner where you can see the wheels turning um, with the person, um, personal attributes, um, such as their personal preferences, um, might um, influence in interest in the environment, such as maybe the person is interested in pets, such as a dog. And if that dog is introduced at a particular time of day, this might lead them to increased engagement, which then improves affect and then improves interaction among um, the residents or um, group of individuals. In um, a study of older adults using multivariate analysis, um, looking at social networks over time, um, it was determined that the actual receipt of engagement or of social support and engagement, not just the availability of social networks provided protective effects. And this is important because in the nursing home setting, there is a social network. However, the person may not be engaged and they may not feel emotional support because people are you know, isolated and looking out the window or not engaging with one another. Trajectories over a seven year period determined that social integration, family ties and engagement with family were all um, important for maintaining cognitive function in older adults. Participation in community activities has also been determined to be important and protective of cognitive abilities. For example, um, helping out in a community program is um, viewed positively and has a positive effect on cognition. Speech language pathologists um, work in skilled nursing facilities or nursing homes in the U.S. at about a rate of 8.3 percent. And um, one reason for this um, percentage is that quite a few speech language pathologists do work in the public schools. So this 8.3 percent is still a significant percentage of the medical settings. And it's thought that the number will continue to rise 
arise in coming years. Um, the SLPs are presented with a varied caseload um, and individuals are more acutely ill than in the past. Um, there are many challenges to working in a nursing home setting. Certified nursing assistants um, provide the direct care in the U.S. for residents, and unfortunately, they're um, not paid well, they're overworked, and sometimes their work is part-time. These are some of the um, areas that speech-language pathologists work on in a nursing home setting, and as you can see, um, some uh, of the areas, memory, problem solving, and probably language to a certain extent could be considered part of cognition. Nursing home residents on average are 80 years of age. So we conducted uh, multi-site intervention across nursing homes in the state of Kentucky. And with over a thousand participants, the average age was 80. And this group is particularly vulnerable to COVID-19 and um, also the certified nursing assistants who work with the residents also have the challenges that I mentioned along with also being exposed to COVID-19 in that setting. Um, group activities have been canceled in many nursing home facilities. Um, residents eat in their rooms and communal dining has been stopped in many of these um, sites. Interventions that have been found to be successful to decrease loneliness um, often were not feasible during COVID-19. Now I just read today a news report that um, with the continued vaccination of residents in nursing homes in the US that the rate of COVID-19 is dramatically decreasing. So hopefully we'll be able to see more opening and more um, increases in group activity in the nursing home setting. Some of the barriers to exercise in nursing homes include staffing in that you need sometimes staff to assist residents coming to a room in which to exercise or really to participate in any group activity. Um, schedules are set by the administration and staff and may be inflexible. Um, so it's not only the staff, the residents, because they're older, really do appreciate a routine that is set and does not change. Um, exercise has to usually take place indoors, and there may not be adequate space and lighting for exercise. Additionally, you need to have buy-in from the facility in order to conduct the exercise program. And I can tell you from our personal experience, this varies quite a bit from nursing home to nursing home, just based on the particular um, staff and administration of the nursing home. Um, in a study that we um, published in 2020, um, we looked at adherence in a nursing home exercise program. And um, we found that the rating or quality of the nursing home did influence um, adherence to an exercise program. So we judged adherence as being poor if they attended less than 40% of exercise and social groups. Um, average if they participated 40 to 65% of the time and good if it was over 65%. And as you may recall, um, in research in the community, we're looking on average at 70% participation. So um, this is below what you typically see in the community for the reasons that I mentioned before. However, quality of nursing home rating definitely impacted as well, where you can see that um, poor attendance was very common in one, two, and three star ratings, and then started to decrease with four and five star ratings. And this was um, statistically significant. So increases in physical activity and social opportunities may lead to better cognition and brain health, 
better mood, less burden for the staff, and particularly in nursing home residents where they may be dependent for dressing and assistance with bathing, ambulation around the nursing home. So as the residents become more independent, more physically healthy, um, staff then uh, do not have as heavy of a workload. Um, also, as residents don't, um, don't become as dependent on staff, they can maintain a level of independence and have better mood as well. The social, social climate in the nursing home can also be improved with physical activity and social opportunities. So let's go on to talk about interventions in nursing home settings. Some of the recommendations that were discussed in 2015 at an International Association of Gerontology and Geriatrics um, it, at a um, meeting in France recommended that physical activity and exercise in nursing homes create activities um, that are motivating and pleasurable and stimulate movement versus prolonged sitting, are organized in group activities, incorporate new technology, and provide multi-component exercise training, including exercise at least two times per week, 35 to 45 minutes per session. This is a program that we have worked on. It was developed by my colleague, Jason Crandall, who's an exercise scientist called Bingo Size. And Bingo Size incorporates a bingo-like game and physical activity. It incorporates exercise, socialization, communication strategies with the help of student involvement. And as you can see here, the students in this particular slide um, there's one in the front with a red and black jacket on, a couple that are standing up and demonstrating exercises. And so students were trained to communicate well with the residents and also to help them with exercise and socially interact with them. Bingo is a really popular game in the U.S. among older adults um, because of the social opportunities it provides. I realize that bingo is not in every country, so um, it may be new to some of you. Older adults are more likely to exercise if there is a social component. And so this program did really offer um, a social component. A smaller study, in fact, that we conducted found that residents were more likely to communicate and to um, comprehend information following a bingo size session um, as opposed to pre-bingo size. So what is bingo size? So um, bingo size involves um, following a card with various letters and numbers on it. And um, the bingo caller will call a letter number com combination. So in bingo size, there would be a student leader. Sometimes we had a resident with dementia who would call the number um, letter combination. Um, and they would um, call the letter number combination and the participants would put a small plastic chip on um, the particular space. So I might say B15, I19, G58, etc. And the goal is to fill with chips a, a line, either vertical, diagonal, or horizontal. And when that line is filled, the person calls bingo and also um, wins a prize in this case. So um, I'd just like to um, share with you exactly how this might work. So I'll give you a little experience in actually exercising. So um, if you want to try one exercise that we would do in bingo size and see if this improves your cognition for the rest of my talk, um, you would sit up straight in your chair with feet flat on the floor 
and place your hands on your shoulders. And then you would just simply extend your arms out and repeat five times. So go ahead and try it with me and see if um, this helps you to maintain your attention for the rest of the talk. So one, two, three, four, five. And of course we would go on to do other exercises and also return to the bingo calls. Now, during this um, bingo size program, we would also evaluate individuals interaction with others and the behaviors that they displayed. So healthcare workers would identify both positive and negative behaviors from a list. So we might ask participants, do you feel happy or sad using the same gender photos and verbal and nonverbal responses were used. So um, I um, came up with the idea of asking individuals, do you feel happy or sad? Because we know that, um, in fact, even people with moderate to severe dementia can answer that question and express how they're feeling um, about a particular um, activity or how they're feeling at a particular time. So let's go on to community interventions. So we've found that mindful walking um, is another possible community um, activity that can be used to stimulate um, exercise and also reduce stress and depression. And so here we tell someone to select their most relaxing and comfortable way of walking to avoid losing balance and minimizing the risk of falling. We then tell them to attend to the rhythm of their breathing, the movement of each step, and scan their body for sensations. And some of you may have participated in mindfulness classes. Um, this is a little different because it also involves walking, which some mindful classes, mindfulness classes also incorporate. So we found then that um, some of the results of the community-based mindful walking um, uh, activities resulted in um, older adults completing the program and adhering to the program and stating that it would be useful to others. Um, they also continued to practice mindful walking at about a rate of 65% after the program ended. We found that interestingly decreased negative, um, it decreased incident, incidental negative affect, um, so feelings of depression and anxiety. So this is a measure that we use to um, assess physical activity. And we found that um, using this ActivePal monitor is one way of documenting physical activity that is more precise than asking people to report how active they are, especially because if someone has memory impairment, they may not actually recall how much they exercised. So this is something that we will be using in future research. Um, we also look at um, cognitive assessments that can be um, used within, um, within the activity and um, might be considered ambulatory cognitive assessments that can be presented on either a cell phone or on an iPad. And in this case, we found that with the symbol matches that um, people did improve their processing speed. And um, this was observed through pre, um, from pre and post mindful walking bouts. They also perceived that their cognition had improved. And we also saw longer term improvements in, cog in processing speed and cognitive function between baseline and the end of the program. So our future study and hypothesis is to look at mindful walking within the nursing home setting. And the purpose would be to determine the benefits of exercise and social engagement in a randomized control trial for older adults with cognitive impairment in a nursing home setting. We hypothesize that a walking 
program with mindfulness that includes a discussion group will result in lower stress and depression, greater gains in physical activity, cognition, social engagement, and adherence than a mindful walking intervention alone provided to residents and compared to a control group. So you can see in the schematic above, comparing those who engage in mindful walking with discussion versus mindful walking alone versus treatment as usual, which is usually um, sitting um, and not being active. So in conclusion then, aging results in an accumulation of risk factors, including lack of physical activity and social engagement that may re result in conversion to dementia. By increasing exercise, aerobic um, exercise in particular, helps to decrease cognitive decline and reduces other um, health risk. Older adults, however, may not be able to adhere to higher intensity aerobic exercise. Therefore, lower intensity may be protective, but we need to study this further. Increasing social engagement improves cognition. However, combining exercise and social engagement and mindfulness may be optimal. So I'd like to thank you for listening to my presentation. Again, I am Jean Neal Stringess, and if you would like to email me with a list or with a request for the um, references cited, I would be happy to provide that to you. And otherwise, I will just um, wait for um, Dirk to um, ask um, the questions that you may have posed. Great. Thank you so much, Jean. That was wonderful. Thank you very much. I just want to say I'm really looking forward to the uh, department bingo size night. <laughs> it's coming up. I think the level of physical exercise is just right for our department. So Sounds good. We have a number of questions already in the chat box, so I'll just go ahead and read those out. That sounds um, great. First one is uh, from Ashley Moncrief. Uh, is there any literature on the accuracy of self-reported exercise for individuals at various levels of cognitive functioning? To my knowledge, there is not. However, I think the question that you raise is a really good one because um, that would be important particularly with nursing home residents who have a high rate of cognitive impairment. So I do feel that because so much of the historical literature has looked at self-report, um, that this is a great area to look into further. Thank you. And we have a question from Julius Fridrikson. For the studies that show a relationship between social ties and cognitive decline, do they report effect sizes? And if so, how does the effect of social interactions or the lack thereof compare to other factors such as genetics or diet? So um, social engagement um, has more of an effect than um, diet, for example. Um, in fact, going back to the very first slide, Interestingly, obesity, reversal of obesity has a very small effect. And so engagement has been found to be as important, if not more important than exercise even. And um, so the effect size is quite significant. And um, Julius, I appreciate that you asked that question because of your obvious expertise in aphasia. Um, I have long wondered the, about the impact of social engagement on our aphasia treatment. And I can offer a couple um, anecdotal observations. Um, many years ago, I worked in a VA medical setting and I was talking with another older speech language pathologist at the time I was not as old, but um, he mentioned that you know, my patients are getting better with aphasia because of who I am and not the treatment that I'm providing. And, you know, it's possibly true that that did have an effect, the relationship that I had with the patients that I was providing treatment to. Another example that I have is that um, I was involved in a research project 
at the University of Cincinnati on constraint-induced aphasia therapy. And one of the lead clinicians on that project had said she was really questioning how much the social aspect to the group therapy played into the fact that people were getting better in the program. And that was, these again are just very anecdotal observations, but I do feel that um, social engagement is really critical. I think many of the clinicians know that, but um, you know, further examination of social engagement from a really broad perspective, I think is warranted in, in a lot of the research that we do. Thank you. And we have a question from Mariam Orko Dashvili. Uh, what would be your recommendations for the elderly in times of the pandemic when going out and socializing are risk factors? How should they engage either physically or socially under these conditions? Okay, wonderful question. So, um, as I said, um, thankfully, the vaccine in the United States and in other countries is having um, a positive benefit for older adults and many countries that I'm aware of are vaccinating older adults. Um, however, I did just read a medical um, opinion this morning also and um, there is supposed to be still um, restrictions on older adults in the case of, for example, using air travel, going into restaurants, which are still considered to be um, risky for the older adult. Um, however, other activities like getting together with a group of people who are vaccinated or family who are vaccinated, that is considered less risky. Um, and so that would be one approach that the older adult is vaccinated and then can interact with others who are also vaccinated. Um, of course, um, use of the phone, use of iPad communication, any kind of electronic um, communication can be helpful. Um, perhaps um, in terms of exercise, I know some like video chat exercise programs can be helpful and really um, walking is still possible out in the community. It's been determined that um, walking is really safe um, in, you know, the outdoors. So if the person is able to safely walk outside, I would highly recommend that. Um, the walking program that we're gonna start in Columbia, hopefully here in South Carolina, will allow people to use walkers or walker, walking aids like walking sticks, which are popular in other countries, not quite as popular here. So um, those would be um, you know, all possible recommendations. Great, thanks. Um, a question from Monica. Thank you for the fascinating talk. Knowing that there are multiple factors that can impact cognitive reserve, could the effects of exercise and social engagement cancel each other out? For example, can we assume that the person who exercises frequently would lose cognitive benefits related to exercise if they do not engage socially? <laughs> well, all I can say is thank you for that question. I hope my research study that's coming up might uh, might address that question um, because you know we hope to look at exercise alone versus exercise plus discussion so it will be interesting to see whether the exercise plus discussion is beneficial or whether the exercise alone is the same um, and so uh, you raise a really interesting question and it is certainly something to consider Thank you. I'm not sure if you mentioned this uh, specifically, uh, Jean, but I was wondering, so uh, you talked about the nursing homes and I was wondering, do you know, is there evidence or do you think that nursing homes may actively discourage exercise by clients to avoid risk of injury through falls, et cetera? Um, they may, well, in a sense, yes, they do, because um, the nursing homes that I encountered, the ones that I visited, 
um, and there were quite a few. Of course, it was within one state, but um, very few nursing homes, for example, allow outdoor walking. So they're confined indoors. Often the doors are locked. Um, and so, in fact, almost in every facility that I've been in, um, there's a double locking system where you come in through one locked door and then you wait in the middle and you come into another locked door. And so um, they very rarely go outside. Now there may be some exceptions, exceptional nursing homes that offer outdoor walking, but I would say it's definitely in the US very um, unusual um, because um, precisely for the point that you mentioned, Dirk, of you know, fear of falling. So that would be one obvious, because if you're not able to go outside, you're going to exercise less. Um, and then secondly, um, as I mentioned, they're often dependent on somebody getting them dressed or helping them to dress or taking them to a particular activity room, having somebody to lead any type of group activity. And um, if those, if that helper is not available, then the person will also not exercise as much. So I, I don't know if it's necessarily intentional, but um, just by the fact of how nursing homes operate, they are going to exercise less. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Stacy Fritz, who's here in South Carolina. There's a mounting level of evidence on the fact that we are underdosing older adults when it comes to exercise. Any thoughts on this and how it relates to your past projects? Okay. Um, yes, I think that's really fascinating. Um, and of course, really depends also on the ability, physical abilities, as you know, Stacy is a physical therapist. Um, the physical abilities of the individual, um, and then also um, the cognitive abilities of the individual in terms of, um, you know, again, how much they're able to direct their own exercise program. So um, that's a fascinating question. I do know that, that fear of falling comes into play. So, um, Older adults frequently are afraid of falling, which then leads to less exercise, which then leads to less poor physical abilities. And that could result in underdosing as well. But um, I, you know, I do think it's fascinating. The only uh, the study that I come back to is six to nine miles a week, but um, Stacy, maybe you're thinking of even more um, exercise. And so um, it would be interesting to look at that uh, subgroup of people who actually are super exercisers um, and see if, you know, others could join that upper quartile. Great. Yeah. We still have uh, quite a few questions, Jean. So if, if you're still good, then, then we I'm good. can I'm keep good. going. But you can yep. stop me too if you think you've had enough. A uh, question from Julianne Alexander. Thank you for the talk. You, you mentioned research related to depression and cognition. Are there any great studies you know of in that vein and also linked to exercise? So depression and cognition. Yes, I will have to get back with you on kind of the best um, study to address that. But it's certainly, um, we know that, that, um, exercise decreases depression and um, depression then has, you know, lessening of depression also has a positive impact on cognition. So right off the top of my head, I don't know of an ideal study. I personally would be thinking of possibly looking at research from the University of Pittsburgh because of um, they're excellent psychiatric care and also um, research on dementia. So that, that would be one um, group that I might, or one university that I might look into further for um, getting it kind of the most cutting ed edge research in that area. 
Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. A question from Zozan Ayrustaram. Uh, when talking about social engagement, would there be a difference uh, between elderly who are socially active with friends and even old, old colleagues and elderly who are closely tied to their families and relatives? I wondered because especially people in more Eastern cultures tend to rely, really value and benefit from socializing within family. Would that be any different than actually socializing with friends and strangers maybe? So um, socializing with family has, um, is something that is considered positive. And um, I did read one study that um, I think was coming from the Middle East and they were looking at that in particular um, for similar cultural reasons. And they still um, found that um, socializing outside of the home was beneficial so um, interacting in the community was still considered <clears throat> beneficial beyond just interacting with family. Great, thanks. We have two more questions. Mm -hmm. uh, Suzanne Adlov asks, uh, I was struck by your comments on social engagement earlier. I'm sorry if I missed it, but I'm interested in how social engagement of a patient and clinician can be measured and then manipulated in a study. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, Suzanne, are you thinking within the clinical setting, like in a therapy setting, for example? Yes, okay. is what she says. So, um, you know, it's interesting. Um, I, I do know there is research that was conducted at Johns Hopkins on engagement during rehabilitation sessions. So I thought it was really fascinating. I think it actually kind of got me thinking along these lines that they found that, um, and this was not specific to speech language pathology, but they found that individuals who were engaged in the rehabilitation process, be it physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech language pathology, that they had better outcomes. And so they were looking at engagement as a variable separate from the content of the therapy itself. And they found it to be significant and created a um, measure of engagement during the rehabilitation process. Now we developed something um, for group activity during a particular exercise program, which also looks at, at engagement, but I do know there is that literature from um, Johns Hopkins and a real, uh, from a rehabilitation um, program and looking at the importance of engagement. Great, thank you. And a really nice last question uh, because it ties back to aphasia from Ellen Bernstein Ellis. Do you have a sense if the measures for social engagement used in dementia need to be different from those used with aphasia as attention and engagement is often a strength? Look forward to hearing more about ways to measure social engagement. Excellent presentation, thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Um, yes, I can imagine that it would, I'm sure there are differences. Um, however, I know speaking from a very general clinical perspective that um, in any of the clients that we deal with as speech language pathologists, regardless of their cognitive abilities, you will see different levels of engagement. I think even those of us who've worked with children see various levels of engagement in the therapeutic process. And so I do agree, dementia and aphasia would be quite different in terms of the characteristics that you would look for. And I agree, you would expect better attention um, from individuals with aphasia as opposed to those with um, dementia, particularly if that's a weakness for them. Um, but I think across all groups, um, engagement for various reasons might vary. And so it would be interesting to examine that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jean. That brings us to the end of today's presentation. Thanks to the audience for asking all your questions and for attending. Thanks so much, everybody. Bye.